Okay, uh, welcome to these videos in Math 142. We're going to uh, look at polynomial functions in section 3.1. I, I just want to warn you, I go really, really fast, so you may have to hit the pause button from time to time. Okay, before we define what a polynomial function is, let let's talk about power functions. A power function, you've, you've seen these before, I know, uh, is x to a power, the power has to be, this, this is just a fancy way of saying a positive integer. z plus means the positive integers. Okay? And you, you've, we've already seen these. We know what x to the square, x to the 2 looks like. This would be a power function of degree 2. x to the 4, they look pretty similar. In fact, x to the 6 would have the same basic shape, wouldn't it? If it's an even power. Now, it, now and similarly, a power function x cubed looks kind of like this. And so if it's an odd power, they have this, more or less the same shape. It might be steeper, but you get the idea. And then um, if, you, if you want to look at some simple translations of those, this just looks kind of like x to the fourth, but it's been reflected across the x-axis and a little bit narrower. So it might look, look like this. And this one, uh, you take x cubed, you shift it over one to the left, and make it steeper, so it's going to look more like this. All right, so you've you got to know what power functions look, look like, because we define polynomial functions to be... Uh, the sum of power functions. Now, the powers of x have to be positive integers. I, I didn't write this down, but these a sub n's, uh, for the most part, they're going to be real, real numbers. We'll talk about a little bit what happens if they're non-real, but for now, let's just assume that they're real numbers, okay? I didn't write that down, though. Anyway, so a simple example, probably the most simple example of a polynomial function would be a zero-degree polynomial function. We haven't, I don't think we've ever called it this, but it, we just call this a constant function, right? Uh, linear functions can be thought of as polynomial functions of degree 1. Uh, and similarly, we talked quite a bit about uh, quad quadratic functions last quarter. Those are just second degree poly polynomial functions. Okay, well, so let's, here's an example of a third degree polynomial function. Uh, h or h of x. The graph looks kind of like this. And one thing you notice right off the bat is that this doesn't look exactly like x cubed. I mean, it has some humps in it. x cubed doesn't have any humps in it. So this is, this is something that you'll notice when we talk about polynomial functions of degree higher than 2, that the shapes won't all look alike. So what we have to do is look for, look for char characteristics of, of polynomial functions in general, one of which is the end behavior. The end behavior, we're asking the question, what is happening to the graph, or specifically the y-coordinates, as x gets very large, which means x goes to infinity, uh, in this case, if x goes to infinity, the y values are going down to negative infinity. So we say as x goes to infinity, for this particular function, h of x goes to negative infinity. Similarly, as x goes to the left, which means x is going to negative infinity, is, for this function, the graph is going up. So we'd say h of x is going to infinity. So, uh, and, be, and behavior becomes really important. And one thing that's very important about polynomial functions, we'll see this more in class, but they have the same end behavior as their leading term. In other words, whichever, whichever term has the highest power in the end behavior, the polynomial function behaves the same way. So we know that negative x cubed, this is the graph of negative x cubed right here, we, we know that negative x cubed looks kind of like this. So h of x, even though it might have some humps in the middle here, as x goes to infinity, the graph looks more or less the same as x, negative x cubed. As x goes to negative infinity, it does also. Interesting fact. All right, here's another one. If you look at this polynomial function, this is a polynomial function of degree 4. Uh, even though it has some humps in it, it turns out it's in the end behavior, it behaves just like 2x to the fourth power, which says as x goes to infinity, f of x is going to infinity. As x goes to negative infinity, f of x is also going to infinity, right? Okay, the other thing I want to talk about today are what are called real zeros. How to find the real zeros of a polynomial function. A real number c, x equals c, is a zero or a root of a polynomial function if when you plug x into the polynomial function you get zero. So we've done this a lot um, last quarter. Find the real zeros of this function. We're trying to find the values of x that make it zero. Now, sometimes you're lucky enough to factor it. Otherwise, sometimes you may have to use the quadratic formula, but when you factor this, you get x equals negative one half x equals 1, which corresponds to the two x-intercepts. Anyway, here's a, here's a summary of what you can say about the, the real zeros of a polynomial function. 
c is a real zero of p of x, or p, if when you plug x into the function, the formula, you get zero. It also means the same thing as x minus c is a factor of p of x. This becomes really important later. Um, and it also means x, is an, uh, x equals c is an x-intercept of p. As long as it's a real zero, the zeros become the x-intercepts. Now in terms of factors, remember if it's a polynomial function, if you can factor it, you can determine the, the zeros. And, and certainly if you can determine the zeros, you can factor it. That's what, that's what the factoring part says right here. All right, so the obvious question would be, one obvious question is, how many real zeros can a polynomial function of degree n have? We'll talk about this a lot in class also, but since each zero becomes a factor, you can write each zero in terms of a factor, uh, uh, you can see each factor adds one to the power, so you would think at most n. Now, it doesn't have to have n though. In fact, uh, in fact uh, can, can you think of a polynomial function of degree uh, two that doesn't have any real zeros? So that's why we say at most, it doesn't have to have any real zeros. Here's a good example, x squared plus 1. Polynomial function degree 2, there's no real zeros. Which, which means, in fact, that there's going to be no x-intercepts, right? No real zeros, no x-intercepts. Let's put it all together. Let, let's find the real zeros in n behavior and make a rough sketch of these graphs, okay? Third degree polynomial function, let's find the zeros first by factoring. It turns out when you factor this, you get three, three zero, three real zeros, that means we're going to have three x-intercepts, right? And the end behavior is going to be like the first term, which is negative x cubed. So I'm just making a rough sketch here. You, you plot your zeros here and here and here. Then it's going to behave like negative x cubed, which means it goes up here and down here. And then if you want to get a little more accurate, you could always make a table and pick a couple more points to see how high up it goes. Let's do another one. Here's a fourth degree polynomial function. And uh, you factor this. Now look what happens when you factor this. You set it equal to zero, factor it. Uh, you get two real zeros here, but here you, here you, you don't have real zeros, you have non-real zeros. We'll talk about that a lot more later. So when, when, you, when you try to solve this and find the real zeros, you only get two values of x. So there's two x-intercepts, right? Not four, there's two. All right, the end behavior is, is x to the fourth. So you put that together. If you put that together, you, you know it looks kind of like this. The zeros here and here. You can plot the y-intercept if you want. Now it turns out this has a little some humps in it, and the way you can find the humps is by making a table, picking some more points. This one, we're trying to find the real zeros and, and behavior and plot the graph. You would factor out a, a negative 2x squared, so it looks like this. You actually have, actually you have three zeros. You have a zero at zero, you have a zero at uh, negative two, and a zero at positive two. We say this zero has multiplicity two, okay? When you have a repeated zero like that to the second power, that's called the multiplicity. Anyway, the end behavior is going to be the same as, it's going to be that of a negative 2x to the fourth. So when you plot these, again, you, you'd plot the zeros. 0, 2, uh, 0, negative, two, negative 2, 0, and 2. It's going to behave like negative x to the fourth. You can, again, you can make it negative 2x to the fourth, I should say. Make a table, you can plot a few more points. But the thing I want to I want, to, want you to notice about this 0 of multiplicity 2, um, it actually... Um, it actually turns up there. Whenever you have a zero that has even multiplicity, it's going to be a turning point, it turns out. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. Okay, with this one, this last one here, you would uh, find the zeros by setting it equal to zero. When, when, when you set it equal to zero, it's already factored, that's nice. You have a zero of multiplicity two at zero, and a zero of multiplicity three at negative two, and the end behavior is uh, that of negative x to the fifth, when you plot all that together, you notice, um, this is something worth no noticing, is you have a, at x equal 2, you have multiplicity 2 again. It's going to be a turning point there. And at x equal negative 2, it has multiplicity 3. It's not going to be a turning point. And th that's, that's the general statement that you can say whenever you have a 0 of, with a certain multiplicity. If the multiplicity is even, the graph will, doesn't actually cross the x-axis at that point. It'll turn. We call it a local max or min, right? As long as it's odd multiplicity, then the graph will actually cross. All right. Well, got to go. Bye-bye.